All right. Um, I make it about time. If you're expecting anything other than a security talk right now, you're in the wrong room. And this is the only time in the entire proceedings where it's perfectly acceptable to go, <gasps> oh my goodness, and gently and safely proceed to the exit. Uh, so please do so. Uh, if not, you're stuck here now, and we're going to be friends whether you like it or not. Uh, my name is Laura. Um, it's wonderful to be here today. Um, I'm going to be doing a bit of a security talk for you, but I'm not like a lot of other security speakers, so um, bear with me. I'm not a magician. I'm not here to show you how to make calculator pop up on your screen um, or to show you a buffer overflow. I'll tell you a depressing fact, though. The OWASP top 10. And raise your hand if you know what OWASP is or the OWASP top 10. Oh, phew. Good. We're making progress. That launched in 2004. In 2004, on the OWASP top 10 was broken authentication, insignificant or insufficient input validation, broken authentication, session management, configuration, all of the same things that are on our current broken with web apps list were on the list in 2004. Raise your hand if that was your career, and from 2004 to 2018, you'd achieved essentially no change. Raise your hand if you'd be happy with that. Not a great state of affairs. Um, now, um, full disclosure, this is my last talk for two years. So if anyone's tweeting, please don't tweet the next tiny little bit. Um, I've decided to deploy a uh, personal project that goes into production in November. Um, so <laughs> bear with me. We're going to have some fun today, but it is the last one for a while. Now, that means I'm going to ask you to make a promise because I'm not going to be around for two years. I'm not going to be here checking up to see if you listened and did stuff. You've got two years to go make some change. So when I come back, and I've you know, had sleep and whatnot, um, I'm going to see amazing change, and I'm going to be really proud of every single damn one of you. Deal? Good. Awesome. Right. Um, now, if you'd have looked at the title and you looked at the description, it was fluffy and didn't tell you anything. So you're very brave for turning up. I'm here today to talk to you actually about architecture and where architecture and building systems really fast meets with some of our squishy human bits, and why we're doing some really dumb things when we're planning our systems architectures and how we can fix them. Kind of some anti-patterns and then what we can do about it. And all of this roots down to fear. Fear is native, it's, it's a natural part of us. How many of you have something in your life you're scared of? Right, raise your hands. How many of you have encountered that thing so far today? No? Okay, be braver. Go, go face your fears, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, fear is around us all the time. The world is a scary place right now, regardless of where you live. There are many things that we are scared of, and security. We, we talk in risk, which essentially boils down to a lot of the time fear. Now, what will go wrong? What is the likelihood of that? What is the chance of it happening? What would the impact be if it did? If this monster came into the room, say an eight-foot bear walked through that door right now, how many of you would be scared? Those of you not raising your hands, you were probably taking selfies, weren't you? <laughs> this is not survival skills. So we'll try again. Eight-foot bear through that door. How is it going to be feeling? Tell me about the feelings of the bear. Is it happy? It's at NDC. It's very excited. It's got a red hoodie. Um, it's probably quite confused, right? Probably a little bit hungry. Uh, how many of you have already started formulating your escape plan for the giant bear coming through the door. Yep. Who's running? Runners? Who's already gone? I run already. I run for fun. I'm going to be fine. How many of you mentally picked out somebody in the room that was probably slower than you and went, I'm fine? <laughs> Fear is very interesting. It does some very interesting things to us. Now, in security, we're really bad at using fear as our motivator. So we come into organizations, people like me, and we go, Right, we've hacked your stuff. You should be very scared now. Your baby is ugly, and now the hackers from all over the world are going to come and get you. Now, for some big organizations, that's absolutely true. They might know who you are and, and be interested in you, and, and they want to take what you have or damage your brand or take on their personal objectives or politics that take it a bit further. But it might be, actually, that you're a tiny wee startup, and what they want is your Amazon credits, because then they can mine some Bitcoin. But what we filled the world with, the security community, is words like this. This is our vocabulary. We say kill chain, cyber war, threat actor. It's like we escaped from a 1988 war movie 
and decided it was appropriate to put this all over our slides. Now, the weird thing is, when you scare people intentionally, as the security community has a habit of doing, it has a really interesting effect on people. The more scared we are, the more scared we get. It's actually self-perpetuating. Now, aside from information security, you might find this out in the world. The more scary news items you read, the more they start to affect you. It's like a kind of uh, increasing return. In fact, there's some really interesting studies on what this does to us. If you are scared, you are more likely to be overly cautious in how you apply controls to risk. So if you live in a state of fear, you are more likely to decide that everything is evil and everything is terrible and respond to everything in a very aggressive and serious and bad way. And that's really interesting. How many of you are scared that the application you've written, some point in your career, will get hacked? How many of you have got code on the internet you wish wasn't there anymore, that you wrote earlier in your career? There is a direct correlation. In fact, when I was a pen tester, we found 40% of the bugs we found in software came from the original founders of the code, so the people who first started it, 40%. How many of you have been the founder on a project? Congratulations. Um, now, the interesting thing about this, when we've got this fear language, we've got this fear culture around us, literally, there are many monsters in the world right now, not just there, that are out to get us, is we are bombarded the whole time. And it means in every decision we make as developers, it's coming through. This kind of, how do we protect ourselves, becomes this very serious business. We start encoding fight, flight, and freeze, which are our primary, primal instincts, into our architectures which is a bit bizarre. Now, I'm not saying security isn't a problem. In fact, the wonderful Tiffany is gonna speak a little bit later today, I think in the next session, in fact, about some of the ways that we are vulnerable. And you should learn about all of this. But you should all for, always also learn about what, this is a, what the effect of this is on your behavior and how you're making your choices. Because making good, appropriate security choices is crucial. You only wanna protect as much as you need to for the situation you're in. Otherwise, you start hindering what you're trying to do. So we should be familiar with this fight. So those with the bear, you were you know, going in fist blazing and, and going to try and take out the eight-foot bear. Not a very good plan, but still, primary instinct. Flight, going to run. Some of you went for the window, or braver than I am. There's two doors. That's a mystery door in the corner. I don't know where it leads, but you know, I, I'm going to take a chance. And we've got mystery doors here, too. Many running opportunities. And then freeze. Literally stand there and go, what the hell is just happening now? I do not know. Uh, bear. Now, how does this work in terms of what we're doing? Well, this is, a, I like this quote. These slides will be available afterwards. Um, but the more you start digging into this, the more this kind of conditioning of fear is really, really dangerous. Now. I'm, I'm not a political speaker, so please don't take any of this as like veiled politics. I, the world is a terrifying place for many reasons, not just for that. But if we live in this, and because our brain is continuously associated with danger right now, we're doing some silly things. Let's have a look how this translates into our architectures. How many of you call yourself an architect? Any of you got? Awesome. Um, I love ar architects. They fit into two camps normally. There's the people who've just been at the company so damn long that if you left, everything is going to break. Um, and those are wonderful people. And then there's people who are formerly trained architects. The rest of you, even if you don't call yourself an architect, you're probably designing architecture all the time without really thinking about it. So let's talk about some architectures that we see all the time. How many of you in your organizations have ever been told, we don't need to worry about the security of our application. It's inside our network. It's internally facing. Yeah? So this is either the castle or if you're British from a very long time ago, the armadillo defense, which is you've got something that's hard on the outside and squishy in the middle. And if you're in the squishy middle, the hard outside will protect you. Now, castles are pretty awesome things. You start digging into castle defenses, and you can spend hours and hours on little rabbit holes on the internet doing it. Now, what were the types of defenses we saw in castles? Go. Moat, yes, absolutely. Drawbridge, yes, what else? High walls, yeah. Soldiers, yeah. I want, by the end of this, you'll have a list in your head of like 50 things and you'll have no avenue to talk about them. So sorry about that. Now, 
castles were concentric buildings, essentially, that had defenses on the outside and the precious things lived in the middle, much like our big monolithic systems. So if you are in monolith land still, and that's still quite the majority of you, while we do talk about microservices a lot, I know from working with a lot of applications that you still probably have a dirty great monolith in the core of your system because that's probably the bit that you can't decompose because if you turned it off, the world would end for your company. And we treat them like this. We've got our outside is actually very complex. It's probably lots of inputs and outputs. It's probably got doors and windows and whatnot. But inside it, we're not rationalizing about it. It's that border is protecting us. Now, if you're in traditional monolith land, you're probably behind a web application firewall and behind some other firewalls, and there's probably a network and ops team protecting your border as well. And it's quite a nice, safe, comforting environment there, right? The trouble is, layered defenses like this create an expectation of safety that somebody else or something else is going to take care of it. So it's like me saying, well, there can never, ever be a bear in this room because I'm going to put um, the lovely Bridget is going to sit outside the door and she's going to be our bear prevention mechanism. <laughs> now, that might make us feel very safe for about 10 minutes. But the reality is, is Bridget going to be able to protect us from all bears? What if more than one bear comes? What if an entire bear army comes? What if a bear comes while Bridget is sleeping? When we've got a defense that we've put on someone else, we've got an expectation there that we haven't really qualified. We haven't said, well, is this actually going to protect us? Is it going to protect us about all the things that are coming? And it's kind of, it's a bit lazy. How many of you would ever say, well, you know, I don't need to worry about the performance of my code. Someone else is going to do that later. Now, the only one that I know that we occasionally do that with is usability. Um, but performance, scaling, all of this, you have to do yourself. Because if you wait for somebody else to do it, or you wait for the external components, it's just not going to work. Now, defenses that are layered can be challenged by a lot of things. So how we deploy our software, our integrations, the deconstruction of, of our ecosystem. So if we're pulling apart our, our architecture into individual component parts. How we distribute it out. Now, um, Bridget did a great talk earlier on Kubernetes and the containerization thing. How many of you are containerizing and splitting and deconstructing these days? Lots of us. How many of you have had a cascading denial of service because you split it into bits, knocked one bit down, and it went like dominoes? No? You've got fun to come. Um, our layered defenses are great if our systems are simple and those layered defenses are impenetrable, but that's not the case. So what are our other anti-patterns, our gatekeepers? Right, I love this warning. It's not a real warning, it's been photoshopped a little bit. Um, but if you've traveled in an airport in the US in the last, I know, probably lifetime for some of you, you look very young, um, you have to remove your shoes, right? How many of you think this is a good security control? No, it's, it's not. It, it creates some really awkward tension, especially when British people are involved, because we, we just get generally flummoxed by the whole thing and feel very nervous, and then we apologize a lot. Um, but for the most part, all we do is make people feel uncomfortable, confuse them, and make people very conscious about the smell of their feet. Um, we have, in the case of this, we've tried to protect against the entire category of vulnerability by having a gatekeeper. We've got TSA in this case. We have a place of responsibility on a user that so we have to prove that we are not malicious. So if you go to an airport, your job is to prove you are not a terrorist. If you have to go into a store, you know, the type of store that says we're going to search your bags and things, you have to prove by your actions that you're not malicious because they can stop and search you if you're you know, acting strangely. We, we put the responsibility back. Now, we do this with our users. We, we say to our users, well, you have to prove that you are you. You have to prove that you are looking after your data. In fact, fun breaches from past ye old days. How many of you remember the VTech breach from a few years ago? Right, VTech devices, old computing devices for children. Um, they had a SQL injection problem, which was pretty, pretty nasty, and a lot of children's images and things were, were leaked online. Now, one of the first actions from that breach was not to fix the problem. The first documented actions from this were for them to change their terms and conditions to say that parents were responsible for their children's data stored inside VTech applications. How many of you think you could be responsible for your own data inside a centralized system? No, I think if I walked up to, say, Facebook and said, hey, well, I'm here to protect my data, they might turn me away. 
I, I'm not convinced we can do this. What's this? Prove you're not a robot. Absolutely, it's capture. How many of you like captures? How many of you, despite knowing they're atrocious, have implemented them in your systems? Yeah, you lot are mean. What we have done very well with captures is we have trained optical character recognition over 10 years, which has been fantastic for Stanford and their digitization of ancient texts. That's wonderful. But with these, we're asking our users to prove they're not a robot. Well, how do we solve captures? Do you know how you bypass a capture, regardless of whether it's this or an image one? The answer isn't anything technical at all. You outsource it to a call center somewhere in Southeast Asia, ostensibly, and it gets sent via a Black Browser plugin, and some other human fills it in for you. So we've essentially put a control in, an anti-pattern in that has stopped our user. It's supposed to stop you know, multiple requests being made to the site by an automated host. And we've asked our user to prove they're human. And in, a sense, in essence, we've done nothing, because all we've done is create a business model where now our attacker is paying a few cents to get this crack for them. Great, wonderful. Then we've got scar tissue. I like scar tissue, kind of. That sounds creepy. But it's not supposed to. Um, now, Adrian Cockcroft, um, formerly of Netflix, now I can't remember where he's at, um, he used to speak about the uh, employee handbook at places like Netflix. And he said that they were the books of scar tissue for an organization. They were the list of things that have previously gone wrong in the organization that we've had to create a rule for. So, for example, warning labels on peanut packages. Yes, peanut packages contain nuts. It's the oldest joke in, on the internet, right? You, you show a warning label. But this exists because someone at some point ate a bag of peanuts and didn't think they had peanuts in them. The same way that caution contents might be hot exists on a cup of coffee. Scar tissue is defenses that we're forming because we had a breach. How many of you have ever sadly had a security incident? How many of you have deployed a weird fix that has you know, fixed that one instance of the security issue? Yeah, like Band-Aid fixes. Now, this is what we call the result of scar tissue and security. These are, you may not be able to read them, catch the slides afterwards. These are all of the rules from a genuine website for passwords. So your password needed to be different from passwords you've used before, eight to 16 characters, don't even get me started on that. It cannot contain a word or acronym found in the password dictionary. It can't have your ID. It needs to have at least one lowercase, one uppercase, one number, one alphanumeric from that list only. Whew. Great. Now, can anyone explain entropy to me? Now, entropy doesn't work very well when you constrain it. It's not entropy anymore. The more rules you put on a password, the less random the passwords become and therefore the less secure the passwords become. So our scar tissue in our password systems is actually making us less secure, but it was done for a security fix. Great. In fact, I've got a system. You can check if you ever see a security control in your organization and you're not sure if it's scar tissue, then look for nausea. Is it not measurable? Can you not tell if it's actually made any difference? Can you, if it's not measurable, I'm a big fir firm believer in measure things. If you can't measure change, you can't measure improvement, it doesn't exist. Is it acute, very specific, such as, you know, you can't have any spiky brackets in this particular field. If you ever see a field that specifically says you cannot have spiky brackets, that's normally because they were terrible at input encoding at some point and have seen a cross-site scripting problem. That's not the fix for cross-site scripting, but that's the fix they've put in in the scar tissue system. Useless, specific, oddly specific. Exclusionary. So kicks other people, kicks users out your system. How many of you have a surname or a name that's got a special character in it? There'll be of Irish descent in here. Apostrophes. Uh, if you come from different parts of the world, having strange characters in your surname or non-English characters, that's fine. That's, that's a legitimate name. But our systems exclude people when we stop putting these crazy filters in. So we're doing these things wrong, but how do we actually build security defenses into our architectures that make sense, that don't use fear, they don't create scar tissue, they don't trust a guardian to save us, no superhero is going to come? Well, it's kind of a way of thinking rather than an approach. So if you're looking for like me to say, well, in .NET 7, I don't know if .NET is at 7, 
I'm, I'm, not a do I'm not a Python programmer. I always feel kind of weird in these spaces, like you might judge me. Um, I'm not going to tell you if you're a framework. What I want you to do is go back to your organizations after this section, and I want you to look at your architectures and your systems and the tools you're building and start looking for these things. And so you can start building on your architecture with security in mind. It won't feel like you're doing security. You're not going to come and like suddenly get a wizard hat and go, I'm a hacker now. You're actually thinking about defense. Now, a little bit of homework before we get to that. How many of you have ever robbed a building? Any of you ever broken into your own home? Like forgotten your keys or something? Right, okay, good start. I'd like you to, after this conference is done, when you return to your safe dwelling of choice, I would like you to go and figure out how you would break into your house. <laughs> then once you've done that, I would like you to figure out 50 other ways you would break into your house. Now, it's really, really important that you do all 50 because it's by that process of learning how you would get past controls that you start looking at the architecture of how things have been built and looking at all the pieces of them. If you just do the easiest path at each way, you stop looking at all the rest. Right, so how are we going to do it in our software architectures? We're not going to build castles anymore because monoliths are dead. Sam Newman has wrote it, written his book and he sells out workshops and like he's, he's done a thing, so we, we're not allowed to do that anymore. Sam says so. So we're going to stop building castles. But we're going to take one of the lessons from castles and we're going to mix it with one of the fads of today, tiny houses. So castles, right, have hundreds of different defenses from oily walls to arrow holes to little murder traps where you can trap people between two gates and kill them if you don't like them between the gates. Sorry, it's quite dark castle history. I can't, there's no fluffy version of this, but um, they're on a hill so you can see far. They've got guards at different places. Some guards are subtle and some guards aren't. All of these things, you've got a long, long list. Now, you don't have to do all of these things. It's like you don't have to do all of the security controls that exist for every tiny bit of your architecture. Tiny houses, uh, uh, they, I think they're a pretty global movement now. The idea that you live in a much smaller home and everything just has a purpose for being there, right? There's no waste. You live in a smaller space with less stuff and everything that's there is functional rather than just aesthetic. So, if we're not going to build castles, why don't we take some of the defenses, the ones that matter, the ones that are, uh, suit each element of our architecture, and put them in our little tiny houses? If we see our microservices as our tiny houses, then each little bit has to earn its place. So choose your controls that are suitable for each component. If your component is public facing and it's taking input from third parties, then you're going to have a different set of controls than if you're component is internally facing on a lambda piece of infrastructure, God knows what, is this ephemeral. It doesn't matter that your architecture is made of like 15 different languages and that it was built over 20 years by 15 developers who none of which remember where all of it came from. Take each piece and configure them separately with the best defenses that you can get for that context. Focus on small changes, simple changes that are functional and measurable. You want to be making sure everything you do makes sense. Now, in your frameworks, that means things like if you're going to make a change uh, and push an update out, how are you going to measure that this is successful? How are you going to measure this new bit of code is actually protecting people? Well, first things first, stop measuring who's using it. Start looking at the traffic in and out. Are we seeing behavioral change in it? All of these things can be done with basically no tech. I'm not saying buy a security device. Dear God, the world is already buying too many devices. Go look what you have and see what can be used. Your architecture is probably very distributed now, probably in places that are not this one polite little data center where you know you just lock the door and close it at 5 p.m. and you're all done. Make sure that your entire thing is spread. There's been some really interesting cases um, of exploitation recently. How many of you heard about the fish tank incident recently? If you don't know, there's been really interesting like Hollywood style heists where Places are being hacked via their fish tank control software. Um, people who work for Target, you're probably familiar with being hacked via something that wasn't the primary target. It happens. People who attack aren't doing it because they really care that you wrote your thing in Node and that you really have this really fancy microservice over here. They're objective focused. They just want to get to whatever they want to get to and they're going to go through any channel they can find. So if your infrastructure, you work on, say, the top left over there, great, wonderful. But remember, your top left also is affected by all of the other things around you. So if you don't know what those are, <coughs> go find them. Go figure it out. 
excuse me, I'm like, go. <coughs> oh, video people, you're gonna hate me. So, what should we have make all these changes? So all of these security controls we deploy should be small. Frequently deployed, independent, monitor, consistent. We have to assume they're gonna fail. You evaluate and update. Now, if you're not familiar with this, you should be. This is the same way DevOps works. <coughs> this isn't unique to security. This is about everything in our infrastructure needs to earn its place now. And we have to be prepared to destroy it and put new things in. Security is no different. The approaches we took to security 15 years ago do not apply to all the things we use now. For example, how many of you deploy on Lambda? <coughs> oh, excuse me. Lambda's very interesting because the hardware is ephemeral. So whereas you would have previously set up a web application on a server, and it still exists, so when you compromise it, you might sit on the box, make yourself a cozy nest, uh, and then go about your business. In Lambda, it doesn't work that way. In Lambda, it only exists for the period the call is made. So as an attacker, you can't go and sit on the Lambda box and make a cozy nest. What does that mean? Well, it means we're not gonna attack your Lambda service as much. We're probably just gonna go after your AWS account, because that's far more powerful, and we can probably get to somewhere else in your infrastructure. Yes, please. This lady is a superhero. Ah. So whatever you are doing, we have to make sure that we're updating our approach with our changes. Now, guardians, gatekeepers, they're equivalent of TSA. Um, I want you to walk, turn your infrastructure into an army of meerkats. What do meerkats do when they see a threat? Sorry? Pop the heads up. What else do they do? They do alert the pack. They are a collaborative, defensive, tribal little species, albeit they're actually immune to poisons, which is kind of exciting. Um, and they also are very mean and nasty and hurt each other a lot. But let's overlook that bit. They work together. Every member of their little tribe, every member of their little community monitors and alerts the rest. Now, how many of you monitor the security of your application right now? How many of you have a team that does that for you? One or two of you, the rest of you are like, I have no idea. <laughs> Yellow, <laughs> it's on the internet. We haven't been hacked yet, so it must be fine. Um, we have to make sure that we are monitoring everything around us and we are alerting quickly. Much like you're building dashboards to monitor your infrastructure or your DevOps or whatever, your containers. How many of you got dashboards on the wall? Primary reason to buy a 55 inch TV right now? Build a dashboard. Um, I'm sure, sure Splunk gives them for free if you give them their firstborn child. So you build your, your alerting and monitoring now as part of your day-to-day -day because you don't want to be on call. You don't want to be there at 2 a.m. So you're building your alerting and your resilience. Security should be in there. And not, I'm not talking about a specialist security log. Best security log for, for looking for SQL injection attacks, your slow query log if you have one. If you haven't got one, turn it on. Because if you suddenly turn a quick query that's supposed to bring back three rows into something that's bringing back your whole database, it's going to take a bit longer. You want to be flagging abnormal in your normal places. See what you already have in a different way and alert on it. Now, that means actually being responsible for responding to security incidents yourself. Be supported by a security team if you have one, but it might be that you actually have to take on some of this yourself. Now, fun fact, I live in New Zealand. In New Zealand, we have 435 security professionals nationally. We have 35 penetration testers. Our average security team size is 1.7 people, and our largest team in the whole country is 19 people. So when we say we need some help from the dev community or from other bits of the technical space, we're not kidding. You cannot protect an entire nation's uh, infrastructure and companies and assets with 400 people. So in the same way that not every company has the same resources as a big Silicon Valley monster. How many of you work for a company that you wish you had more resources and you wish you had more people to help with this stuff? That's more normal than you'd think. Most conference speakers come up here and you know, they come from the Netflix and the Amazons of the world. And they go, well, it's okay, our 300 people built a tool. And I'm very happy for them. But if you've got that many people, that's a luxury that most people don't have. So we're going to monitor and we're going to um, 
aggregate all the data from our entire infrastructure, and that might be stuff you aren't in control of right now. You're going to have to go play well with some others. Now, there's some things you can put into your infrastructure as well that can help with this, that can help raise the alarm. So the two common ones are honey pits and honey pots. So a honey pit is you stick an intentional vulnerability in your network that it doesn't really do anything, but it's a really tempting little treat to an attacker. And it slows them down. So there are some open source tools being developed and launched for this now. And if any of you have written PHP about 10 years ago, you're probably familiar with how these are probably going to look on the inside. Um, but they tangle up our attackers in essentially honey, in a sticky mess. So they kind of spend a lot of time trying to compromise it. And in the meantime, you know if something has touched that, then we've got something going on. Now, a honey pot is slightly different. So rather than trying to tangle them up, searching for a vulnerability that will never end, a honey pot is an intentionally vulnerable looking box. It doesn't really have much on it, but it's just kind of bait. Now, there used to be a very famous um, security and forensics project called the, the Honey Pot Project, um, or Honey Net Project. And they would put these out on the internet to see what happened. Now, the interesting thing about a honeypot is that you don't choose what behavior. You're not going to choose which vulnerability they go after. You see what skills they're bringing. You see what they're going to do. And so you get your alerts from them. And then you can do forensics on the boxes and have a look. Now, if any of you are sat there going, I don't do computer forensics. This is wizardry. Anyone tried it before? Now, we're going back in the history of the internet here. But there are some glorious forensics challenges you could pick up today and actually go run with. Um, the old honey net boxes are still there for you to go and learn how to do forensic examination on. There, was, there used to be Christmas challenges, in fact, where you could do forensics on image files and prove whether Rudolph had killed grandma. So they take you know, just a few hours, but it's a great way to get stuck in. There's definitely no need to think you're not a security person if you do development. Security people, on the whole, are engineers that just think a bit differently. So you've got the same skill set we do. You've just got more attention to detail. So we need to go from our um, castles to our tiny houses. We need to go from our gatekeepers, like our PSA, to our guardians, to our meerkats. Everything's looking out and everything's reporting in. And we're not asking people to vet themselves coming in. And then we're going to move from our scar tissue to intelligent defenses. Now, the first thing I'm going to say in this is we live in a bubble, all of us. We are engineers. <laughs> And the way we see the world is not the same way that 99% of the rest of the world see the world. If you want to really understand how your users use your stuff and how to protect them, you need to get out of your office and you need to go and sit with regular people. There's a wonderful security advocate called Jessica Irwin. And she tweets a, a lot about security awareness and changing behavior. And she refers to her gang of old ladies. And this is a literal gang of old ladies that live in her street. And she helps them do things like using password managers and updating their phones and things. By doing that, by being out and seeing and interacting with your users, you see how they actually work. Um, your usability teams, if you have one, probably even already have the mechanics for you to do this. Never assume the way you do things is the way they do. And to add to that, right, let's do a little survey. If a good password is long, say over 20 characters, is pseudo-random, so lots of different characters in the mix. You use it for one system only. You've never, ever reused that password anywhere else. Nobody else knows it. This is a good password, that kind of thing. That's a 10. And a bad password is a 0. So that's you use your first name in lowercase to every system you've ever touched, and you've never changed your password in your life. How would you rate your personal behaviors for your passwords? From a 0 to 10. Raise your hand if you think you're a 10. Yeah, some of us, so there's like one or two of you going, I'm going to regret doing this and doing the wavy hand thing. How many of you are somewhere else? I'm not a 10. I'm a security person. I know I'm not a 10. Yeah? Seven, six, five? Anyone are going to admit to under five? It's OK if you are. It's actually really important you admit if you are. Why am I asking this? Well, because we're the engineers, right? We're the people who built the systems. We're the people who are expecting our users to behave in a certain safe way in our systems. And if we don't follow these rules ourselves, if we are doing bad password behaviors, how on earth are we expecting people who aren't engineers to behave any differently? If you know your behavior is already less than 10, then think of that as a way to kind of remember 
that your bubble might be getting in the way of your expectation on your users. So, how can we build these defenses that aren't scar tissue? Well, we can focus on usability and accessibility. Let's talk about forgotten password mechanisms just for a second. Right, forgotten password mechanism is pretty simple, right? You put your username into it, you hit your button, off you go. You get a link through, blah, 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 blah. Wonderful. Now, there's a few decisions you have to make on the way to doing that as a developer, right? So, for example, that token, I hope we all agree, should expire eventually. It shouldn't just sit in your inbox forever. Are we all agreeing? Nod. If you don't agree, you now agree, and you just learned something. How long do we think this token should last? How long should it live for? Two hours. Anyone different? Oh, fluffy answers. Pick a number. 15 minutes. Anyone longer than two hours or shorter than 15 minutes? Oh, I know. You're all sat there going, I don't want to make these decisions. That's what BAs are for. Um, <laughs> But the reality is we have to make the decision. Now, it's interesting because if we make the wrong decision here, we compromise our security in some really fun ways, and it's nothing to do with writing a flaw in the software. So, for example, if we do it at 15 minutes, what do most people do after they've clicked the forgotten password button? What's the next action? For almost all of you, you'll go to the next tab, which is probably one of 3,000, and you'll go and check your email. Great. What's the real world doing at that point? Something else. Now, there's an interesting bit about people. We build our expectation systems based on metaphors of the world we've seen before. So if, you didn't, if you're not an engineer, if you're not native to email, for example, you built your understanding of email based on other systems you knew. Now, what systems did people know before email? Sorry? Oh, good Lord. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yes, that's oddly specific. Yes, they may have done. Um, postal system. Yep. What's the interesting thing about a postal system? What's the expectation of a postal system? You send something. It's not instant. There's a delay. Now, most of us modify this expectation from being like two weeks to being a period of time, but we've got mentally in our head, they're going to have to send me a message. Great. Now, for some people, that means, well, they'll go, all right, okay, I'll come back to that later because it's going to take some time to arrive. And so they'll go and have a cup of tea. Or they'll go and read one article on Reddit that links to like 6,000 articles on Reddit, and then it's like 3 a.m. Now, what happens if they then get to their inbox and that link has expired? So 15 minutes has passed. What do they have to do then? Do it again. What happens when people have to keep doing things again? They either give up, absolutely. Now, what happens when people give up and stop using your system? Unemployment. Um, great, we don't want that one. Right, what else could they do? Kind of the same thing. What else? Uh, they could. Um, at this point, they, they could, and the next time they choose a password, they, they you know, choose fluffy one. Um, what else? They could learn from it. That would be adorable. Um, <laughs> I like that idea. Um, I'm a dreamer too. Um, sometimes they sign up for another account. So I can't get into my one account. This is really tedious. I'll sign up for another one. Now you've got fragmented identities in your system. Or what's the problem with fragmented identities in a system? If you can't list identity problems with uh, sorry problems with identity fragmentation, you've never really encountered it before. Um, merging them is a pain in the bum. Doing any analytics over your data set is now completely impaired because your individual people are not necessarily individual people, so you've got a flaw in your analysis. We don't want that to happen. That's horrible. Um, we've got other options. So they are going elsewhere or not using us. They are signing up with another account. They are potentially going on the social media and being angry. Any of you done that before? None of you? Are you all really well behaved in Minnesota? <laughs> you just like like silently gripe and just go, no. It was, it was a very interesting day, and then off you go. Um, now, the interesting thing with social media, what's the impact of them going on social media and getting angry, other than yelling in a dark room? Sorry? Revenue, reputation? Yes, but something even worse than that? Sorry? Confidence in the system? Yeah, absolutely. But there's something else. 
So yeah, absolutely, is revenue um, damaging, reputation damaging, but what about Good Samaritan attacks? Now, Good Samaritan attacks are where somebody says, oh hey, hello internet, I'm very angry today, I couldn't log into my bank, this is totally dumb, I'm never gonna use them again. And the first person to respond goes, oh hey, oh, yeah, I had that problem yesterday. I realized that if I use this link over here, then I could log in no problems. So just give it a shot, it might save you some time. I know that I saved me loads of time in the end. And it can be a link to a malicious site, it could be a link to malware, it could be an attempt to steal credentials, drop malicious software, it, it, all sorts of bad things happen. How many of you use Stack Overflow to code? Hi. Yeah, so how many of you validate those first responders, those upvoted responses to questions on Stack Overflow? Just saying, if I was gonna say influence a developer, <laughs> Answering their questions on Stack Overflow is a really great way to do that. Okay, so that's good Samaritan attacks. We could also go to a customer support center. We could ring up. Fantastic, wonderful. What's the problem with that? Absolutely. When we do identity verification in the computer, we look at a username and a password and we go, pass or fail, right? You know, it's black or white. You go in, you don't go in. The second you get to a human, we've got a problem. And it's not a problem that humans are stupid. If you're sat there going, well, yeah, but they're silly people and they didn't follow the script. There's an interesting thing going on with incentivization in call centers. The people who are in customer support are incentivized to keep people happy, to make calls go smoothly and quickly. So when we put that kind of motivation next to the requirement to slow people down and I verify their identity, those two things, dis there's a disconnect, there's a conflict which increases the likelihood that the call center person, the support person, bypasses controls to help the person out. You're asking them to literally fight against their core instinct. So it doesn't always end well. And you may have read about, you know, Amazon had some problems with this. There's a wonderful video from DEF CON a few years ago of um, a social engineer named Jessica taking control of somebody's cell phone account. It's just two minutes long. It's a great video to, to examine this. So we don't want people in our call centers. And all of this, all of these vulnerabilities, which aren't in your code, you know, being attacked on social media, being attacked in your call center, losing revenue, having identity fragmentation, came from you choosing the number 15 over the number 60, or the number whatever. That decision, those simple little things that you're choosing, have massive ripples on your architecture, of the, the security architecture of your entire system. Remember your architecture isn't just the things you build. It's all of the interaction points of your system. That includes the people. That includes the marketing teams. It includes any point where you could end up pushing your user base to. You need to be able to monitor things. You need to be able to monitor, well, how many people are using my forgotten password? How many then come back and do it again within two hours? Can we see any evidence that people are then going from this to social media? Can we correlate these items together? This kind of visibility and monitoring helps us decide if the control is worth it. For example, an old control you may have heard of, and when you do a forgotten password and you put your username in, if it's not your username, you should then definitely put a generic error message up that definitely doesn't tell you if it's your username or not. Has everyone had that drilled into them at some point? It's like the textbook OWASP answer to username enumeration have generic error messages. And it's terrible advice. What happens when a user is confronted with a generic error message and doesn't get their email? Well, they start down this confusion circle again. Maybe it's they typoed their username. Maybe they were using a different email address, so they start doing more of them. We've taken away all of their feedback, all of their ability to make good choices, and now we've got them into this weird, confusing guessing behavior. And they're gonna end up in the same places as our bad timeout. They're gonna end up in call centers. They're gonna end up not using our things anymore. So be very careful and monitor your controls and make sure they're not just what the textbook tells you, but that they're actually working for your environment, that you're not pushing people somewhere else. I like this, for example. This is a, a better feedback mechanism than the scar tissue one that we saw previously for passwords. It told you the length. It tells you what you've got in it. It tells you how long it would take to crack your password which admittedly looks like magic to most humans. It's not, but they're not gonna explain it here. Either way, it's got positive feedback all the way through. Look at the language, fantastic. Using a password 
that's making you as secure as Fort Knox. It's a nice system. It's letting them show the password so they can see if it's the right one. I'm a big fan of taking away some of the complexity with security, some of the nasty things we've been doing, and making it easier to make good choices. And this is a nice example of it. So, where did we go with this talk? Well, fear is all around us. Security, in fact, is for most of us not the scariest monster in the room. We are in fear behaviors all the time at the moment, and it's having funny effects on us. It's making the decisions we make in our architectures and outside our architectures not necessarily the best ones. We looked at three anti-patterns. We looked at um, scar tissue. We looked at gatekeepers. And we looked at castles for how we're building our systems. And if you know you're in one of those systems where we believe you're hard on the outside and safe in the middle, or if you know you've got controls or bits in your front end that are just scar tissue because you had one stray character one time, it led to cross-site scripting, now's the time to look at these and go, let's do something new. And then we looked at some of the solutions to these. And it's not about me going, well, here's how to build it. It's here's how to think about it. Think about your security as shepherds. You are not there to be the, the police of the system. You are there to shepherd them towards good choices. People will make good choices if they're given the right environment. We're literally psychologically programmed to follow good, safe channels. We just have to create them. Um, if you have any questions, we do have uh, about a minute or two. I don't know, probably. I don't know, about it time. Um, mainly because my watch is on like several different time zones. Um, if not, you can find me on the Twitters or at the email. Um, and please, yeah, thank you. Hello. How, so the question was, how do you convince your coworkers that their internal site needs some security? Um, it's tricky, if I'm completely honest. Especially as a lot of internal sites are, they're written in very different ways than we do write the external ones, sometimes by very different teams with very different styles. They're often the teams that get the least access to training or less, least of the new technologies. Um, a lot of the time, security doesn't just need to be about protecting against bad things. Security choices can also be about efficiency and making things just more resilient uh, and easier to work with. Um, so looking for an angle like that is, is normally pretty good. Um, alternatively, you, security is an education game, primarily. Um, so rather than going, you know, we're going to get hacked, and it, it's going to showing people what you can do with it. I'll give you an example. Um, my partner worked for a while for a telco. And internally, they had a health system where you could score points by going to the gym or, or like eating healthily. And if you got points, you could get a prize every quarter or whatever. Um, and he discovered you could, there was quite a significant SQL injection problem on it. And on day three of his new job, he was at the top of the leaderboard by about six million points. Um, now, was that a really great way to illustrate the point to his new bosses? Probably not, but he's never really had good judgment like that. But showing people that actually it doesn't take much, like showing them that security isn't a magic trick. Look, it's just this one command, and this is what I can do, is really useful. Now, there's some really great open source projects out there for learning how to do this manually. No, no hacker tools needed, no special case. Like OWASP Juice Box that's just launched recently, or Juice Shop, sorry, which is written in Node and Angular. And it's, it's very representative of, of modern applications. You can go and show that internally, show how these things work. Um, other than that, it just takes time. And it's all relationships, unfortunately. Any other questions? Hello, Bridget. <laughs> okay. If I could give people one step they could take to be less terrifyingly insecure. Right. Go back to your desks. Go back to your project you're working on. List all of your dependencies. All of the myriad of little bits and pieces you pulled together to make your software. I'm not against that. If you write everything yourself, you're insane. I want you to go down that list and be honest as to which one of those is massively out of date. And go and have a look and see what security vulnerabilities were in there. You can go and look at that. That's open source information. You can go look at the vulnerability feeds from NIST or many, many different dependency trackers are out there now. And just go and make a plan to update some of these outdated components. It's not just about breaking a functionality. We know it's painful to update them. But 
keeping them around is exposing you to risk that you didn't write. This is risk you've inherited from someone else. Um, so that can be a nice bit of hygiene that you can do as a team. And even better, it's a great opportunity to automate because there are things like OWASP dependency checker you can stick in your build pipeline that will do this for you. Um, you can, if you have budget, there are paid products for this. So it's an opportunity not just to take on some admin work, but to actually build a bit of your pipeline to make it a little bit more secure. Okay, any other questions? Awesome, please freely enjoy your lunch break. I'll be around if you want to ask any questions. And it's been lovely to see you all. Please vote purple. <laughs>